Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I was amazed, but not really surprised, a few months ago when I read an article written about a math teacher in Florida who conducted an experiment one day with her class. Instead of telling her students to put their cell phones away and silence them, she asked them to take out their phones, put them on loud, and set them on the corner of their desk. Whenever they received a notification, a text message, a phone call, a social media notice, a Snapchat, Twitter alert, email, whatever it was, that they should get up and go to the board and make a tally. 23 students, one class period, over 1,100 notifications. It should be no surprise to us that this is happening. Distractions are around us everywhere. Distractions at home, when we should be spending time with our family. At work, when we should be busy getting our work done. At the movie theater, when we're out to eat. In the car, when we're driving. Distractions are scary because they divert our attention off of what we should be accomplishing. Distractions are unfortunate because they prevent our full concentration And yet, interestingly enough, this is exactly what Jesus Christ has become in the eyes of the religious authorities, a toxic distraction. We meet Jesus Christ this morning on Tuesday of Holy Week, and after the spectacle that he created riding into town, after the parade and fanfare that greeted him, the scribes and the Pharisees And the elders of the law were on red alert, and they were throwing every bomb they had in their arsenal to try to discredit this man, Jesus Christ, so that others would stop listening to him. But Jesus is not fond of bombs, and he is not fond of traps. But what Jesus is fond of doing is naming the reality of the situation before him. And so, as he will often do, He answers the inquiries of the temple officials with a parable. And in this parable, we meet a wealthy and successful man who decides he's going to invest some money in building a brand new state-of-the-art vineyard. But as soon as he erects this grand vineyard, he throws on a new hat and becomes a sharecropper, leasing out this well-oiled machine to a group of tenants, negotiating out the deals of the partnership, and expecting that when it comes time for the harvest of the crop, that he will receive a portion of the profits or a portion of the harvest to sell on his own. For those of you who live here in a portion of the world where agriculture is the driving economic catalyst, this is not odd to you. Landowners, land renters, crop income, this is all business as usual. But it is no longer business as usual in the vineyard of the generous landowner. Not once, not twice, but three times the man sends his servants to the vineyard to collect what is owed to him, and they were beaten and sent away empty-handed. The tenants, the land renters, had become distracted. Distracted by what? Money. Power. They're the ones who have been doing all the work. They've been working their fingers to the bone. They've been out blistering away in the hot sun. But they've completely forgotten that this is all only possible because of the generosity of the landowner who let them share in his good fortune. So the landowner, unhappy with the idea of losing any more servants, sends his son to deal with them hoping that they will recognize him and deal more appropriately with him, that they will recognize him uh, as the heir, and they do. But alas, he receives the same treatment. They saw this man coming to be the son of the landowner, and yet they decided he wasn't anything special, and so they sent one final message to the landowner, and they kill his son. The tenants had become distracted. Distracted by what? Inheritance. Selfishness. In the first century world, it was common knowledge that if a landowner died with no heir to the estate, 
it would be divided amongst his tenants. So as our Lord Jesus wraps up this parable, an already red-hot group of Jewish leaders become even more enraged and infuriated with him because they know that no longer is Jesus just talking in nonsensical riddles, but he is talking about them. This distraction, Jesus Christ, had turned up the volume like the cell phone that I am addicted to that chirps and beeps and chimes more times during the day than I would like to admit, Jesus is making his presence known and the religious leaders don't want anything to do with it. Why? Because what our Lord Jesus has so beautifully done is take the history of Israel's disobedience over the course of seven hundreds of years and condensed it. These religious leaders know that our Father in heaven, the creator of all that exists, chose the people of Israel to be his vineyard. This is a common analogy used in the Old Testament, that he spared no expense to care for them. He uprooted them from the tyranny of Pharaoh in Egypt, and he planted them in the promised land of Canaan. But before that, he entered into covenant with them at Mount Sinai and said, I will be your God, you will be my people. And he made good on the promise that he gave to their forefather Abraham generations before, that out of their great nation would come the Savior of the world. He set them apart. He fenced them in with a law to protect them. He dwelled in their very midst. And yet he saw no fruit of their identity as God's people. He saw not their praise and their adoration. He saw not their repentance and faithfulness, but he saw a very distracted people turning down, bowing to false idols, saw them rejecting the prophets, the servants that he would send to them time and time again, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Micah, Amos, who came to call out their sin and return them to right relationship to the Lord, saying, return to the Lord your God, but they were met only with resentment. The same resentment that now Jesus Christ is receiving. What is possibly going through the minds of these religious and learned men that they would be so hostile and hateful to this man, Jesus Christ? Well, plainly put, He was not just a distraction, but he was also a threat. Because they liked the religious system that they had concocted, the leaders of God's people had been put in place in the beginning to care for God's people, to love them, to guide them in the ways of the Lord. But instead, the leaders of Israel liked having the Jewish people under their control They liked their rules and regulations, which separated the holy people from the unholy sinners over here. They liked counting their money that was rolling in. They liked being at the top of the totem pole. They liked being noticed in public. They basked in their self-righteousness. They coveted their authority. And Jesus was a distraction away from all of this, which meant he had to be dealt with. And Jesus knew this would be coming. This had been in the cards from the beginning. And so when Jesus says that the, that the tenants of the parable would take the son and they would throw him out of the vineyard and they would kill him, he wasn't speaking in the abstract, but instead Jesus was foreshadowing what would be coming in three days when he would be dragged out of the city's gates of Jerusalem and he would be hung on a cross and crucified, hung naked, for the entire world to see. As it says in John 1, Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. They were very distracted. What could they have possibly been thinking? The leaders of God's people had been tasked with building a spiritual household of faith, with constructing a nation of unshakable devotion to God, The God who stood by their ancestors through their wandering and their grumbling. And yet, when the capstone, when the cornerstone himself, the foundation stone, the most important rock on which a structure is built, Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, is sent and put right in front of the leaders, what do they do? 
They reject him. They flog him, beat him, crucify him. But here is the good news today, dear friends. While the people of Israel had become very distracted, while their attention had been diverted away from the God of their forefathers, their God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, had never been distracted, never once diverted his attention away from them or from you. It would have been very easy for the landowner in this parable to annihilate the tenants after they rejected the first messenger. I can tell you if this was my vineyard and my tenants were treating me in this way, I would not have sent a second. I would have wiped them from the land and washed my hands of them altogether. But this is not what the landowner in our parable does. Instead, undeterred, fully focused with his attention fully and completely on you. Yes, you people gathered here at St. Paul Lutheran Church this morning. He sent his one and only son, knowing that he would be struck down and knowing that he would be crucified so that the gate to eternal life might be open for you and me. Through the innocent suffering of our Savior and his rising from the grave three days after Our servant Jesus has been made the cornerstone, the foundation block of our very faith that by his wounds we are healed, that through his wounds we overcome the power of sin, death, and the devil, and that through faith in Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile, man and woman, slave and free, all of us, sinners though we are, can be counted as righteous before God. The greatest word in this entire parable, after all of the ugliness, after all of the distractions were eliminated, after the son was murdered, Jesus says this, God opened the vineyards to others, to you and to me, to outsiders. For you and I, who are not Jewish by birth, For you and I who have no claim to the lineage of Abraham, who are outsiders of this covenant that God made with Israel, Christ's sacrifice at Golgotha makes entrance into God's vineyard, God's estate, God's family possible. Can't we see? This parable is God's salvation story put to paper. Forgiveness, life, Eternity in heaven is all made possible through one man, Jesus Christ. So let's not get distracted from that, shall we? And instead, let's share it with the world. Amen.